Hi, my name is Drew Ripperger, and today I would like to take you through my journey in learning about the Kubernetes ecosystem through the eyes of network observability. Um, so to get things started, I would like to talk a little bit about, just briefly about myself, uh, give you perspective as to where I started. Um, I graduated high school in 2020, so I was part of the, the COVID class that probably went online at the beginning of spring. Um, <clears throat> I find myself now uh, as a computer science student at the Ohio State University, um, and I got my start in in distributed systems through Science Fair, actually, where I worked on um, a project looking at optimizing the raft consensus algorithm. Um, and then if you look into you know, where raft is applied, you see it's applied in etcd, and then that is, there, is then applied in um, Kubernetes to replicate, do some replicated state management um, and replicate you know, state data as to status um, and things of that nature in, in pods to make sure everything's synchronized. Um, <clears throat> so, really where I got my start in Kubernetes then is when I started looking for summer work in the winter of 2020 because um, I wanted something to bridge, to give myself a little bridge between the start of my summer, uh, sorry, the start of my senior year and the start of my freshman year of college. Um, I also wanted to earn a little money and this was something I was not really uh, expecting in a, to get a job in software uh, that paid. Um, it's very, very hard as a high school student to get this kind of opportunity because, you know, you basically have no experience. Um, and what experience you do have is probably not applied or really all that practical. Um, but as somebody who <laughs> liked to browse AngelList a lot uh, for small companies and startups that might be looking for um, some more, um, some less developed candidates, um, I found myself applying to Nermada, which is uh, a company that does day two um, uh, enterprise grade cluster management tools, um, be mostly because they listed Golang on their Angelus profile. I'll be honest, that was basically the only language that I knew to be, I, I knew proficiently and that I was comfortable developing software in. Um, so I applied, not really expecting to get the position, um, and they have actually been amazing to me since, and I uh, have loved my opportunity working with them and developing open source, open source software over the summer. Um, and that is mostly going to be. Uh, what we're talking about today. Uh, my experience working with uh, Jim, Jim Baguadia uh, and developing this tool, Kubernetes. Um, and just a quick uh, <coughs> reprieve. Um, Jim is actually giving uh, a talk with some people from VMware, Alibaba, and um, Google about the multi-tenancy working group. So I definitely go check that out if you haven't already. Um, for our, uh, for Nomada. But the project that I was working on over the summer was Kubernetes. Um, and as the project was presented to me, um, it was an EPPF based Kubernetes network monitor deployed as a daemon set. And I am going to be honest, I didn't understand any of these words. I even had to listen into my calls or into my calls with Jim and try to figure out how he pronounced Kubernetes because I. I had absolutely no idea how to pronounce it, didn't know how to say any of these, didn't know what they meant. Um, pronounced it Kubernetes for a while, is what it is. Um, <clears throat> but as I would find out, um, EPPF would be collecting the networking, networking statistics, Prometheus would be exporting these, and then this application would be deployed as a daemon set, which basically means it is a pod in each node in the cluster, as deployed by Kubernetes. <clears throat> really what is the goal and why were we trying to develop this in the first place? Well, we were looking to create a tool to get a better sense of what was happening in the cluster. We were looking to get, it, to get all encompassing networking statistics um, at the very, very base layer. So how much traffic is going in and out, uh, where are things happening, and what uh, are causing these, what are causing mass, what's causing this traffic. Um, and using Prometheus, this would give us very easily interpretable interpretable statistics to be visualized or processed however we want it upstream. So this tool is open source. However, um, it's very would be very easy for um, an enterprise solution to process these statistics in whatever they, they'd like, really. Um, and as we're going to see, the really the goal is, since it's all encompassing, is we want it to be simple. Um, we want a drag and drop solution that somebody can easy, easily use to get a better idea of the state of their cluster. So here's what I'm going to be talking about uh, today um, in my talk. 
first, we're going to start off with really what is EPPF and how we use it to do some monitoring um, and, and gathering of network traffic. Um, then we're going to talk about the track, how we track these stats and aggregate them, how we get a better idea of what they look like and how we send them to other, uh, other applications. And then how we deploy this, these binaries and applications across our, across our cluster so that we can monitor the individual nodes. Then I'm going to give you uh, just a quick, I'm give you a quick overview of Kubernetes, uh, how we tied all of these different uh, components together, and then we're going to demo it. And I'm going to talk just briefly at the end about uh, what I took from this experience, because it was a really, really incredible uh, journey for me, knowing nothing about Kubernetes or the CNCF ecosystem, to actually being able to build an open source project and speaking with you today. <coughs> So uh, start off, we're going to talk about EPPF, which, if you are not familiar with, uh, stands for the Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Um, and this, while this might sound like a, a very big <laughs> just a jumble of and mishmash of words, um, it's actually not as complicated as you might think. Um, at its base, at its base, uh, most basic level, it is a bytecode that runs uh, in the Linux kernel. So you can run sandboxed code uh, very safely. Um, to interact with any process that might be happening in the background, or really do just about anything inside of the Linux kernel, which if, I don't, if you haven't heard of it yet, might just immediately hit you as being very powerful. Um, just as of now, even though it's a rather new technology, um, there are implications in networking, observability, uh, security. Uh, for instance, Cilium uh, is, a big, uh, is a big user of EPPF um, in the observability space. Um, and Falco and security and uh, really much more. As you can imagine, there are really endless possibilities, endless possibilities of what you could do um, with such a modular system. Um, and you know, how do we implement EPBF? Uh, really what you're going to do is either write EPBF bytecode or probably you're going to write a subset of C um, called BCC, which is maintained by uh, IOVisor. <coughs> I believe started at Netflix. Um, this also has Go bindings as well, which most of the libraries that I utilized in Kubernetes uh, were based off of, uh, Go PPF. Um, if you want to write really custom code, you're going to need BCC, though. Um, it lets you write EPPF bytecode um, and using LLVM as a backend. Um, though I will admit, um, the BCC um, option is much more complicated. If you're not familiar with C, um, absolutely, immediately, just leverage open source code. Um, there really is not a huge advantage to writing your own, especially if you're unfamiliar with, uh, with, with C code. Um, I tried this at the very beginning while I was doing research in eBPF, and I can tell you, you can easily fall down a rabbit hole of doing something very, very simple um, that'll take you two days. Um, so definitely leverage the open source community. Um, I know I used an EPPF package from Datadog that they have in their Datadog agent repository, and I can talk about later um, if you'd like. Uh, we can talk about it later if you'd like, but uh, definitely leverage open source code. Uh, BCC and EPPF, while conceptually rather simplistic, uh, can get very, very difficult to implement um, as it is, again, built into the Linux kernel. So for beginner, this is a start. But you can really use many of the different libraries that are developed by um, some, some large organizations that have really, really amazing, uh, well-developed open source packages. For instance, Falco, which is a part of the, uh, the CNCF um, uh, landscape, as well as Cilium, BPF Trace, BCC, which is, of course, how you're probably going to write eBPF if you'd like, um, and really um, many, many more. Um, I would like to give a quick shout out to uh, Alban from Kinvolk because they, he helped me greatly um, in navigating some of the beginnings of the space. Um, it was really, really an interesting journey trying to figure out where to find all the necessary documentation and he, he helped me come up uh, and figure out an interesting bug that came up with newer versions of the Linux kernel. So he is, he's really an, absolutely an expert with this stuff. So if you would like to learn more, I would definitely recommend um, uh, attending his talk, Beyond the Buzzwords, 
uh, BPF's unexpected role in Kubernetes, which is actually, I believe, just later today at 540. Um, definitely go check him out. He's an absolute expert. He's uh, giving a talk with his co-founder, uh, Andrew Randall. Um, so <clears throat> the next part of Kubernetes was the Prometheus aspect. This was going to play into how we visualized and, and saw these statistics after we, we obtained them with this eBPF piece. And I'll talk, I'll talk more uh, when we get to the to Kubernetes part um, about how we tied these all together. Um, but some of the main points that you, uh, you should probably know if you do not know already, I know Prometheus is a very popular project inside the CNCF uh, landscape, but just to give you a quick idea, um, one of the important points here is that uh, Prometheus is primarily based on pulling data rather than pushing. So if you're used to collecting data in SQL maybe, um, this is going to be very different. Instead of pushing your data into the SQL database, what you're actually going to be doing is letting Prometheus uh, you know, aggregate your data, um, probably using the uh, Prometheus API that's built in Go or you know, whatever language that has bindings for. Um, and then what you're going to be doing is then querying some HTTP endpoint to collect this data at certain intervals. Um, <coughs> this is a, a little bit different than you might be used to, but it actually works quite well and has some very, very interesting implications in uh, visualization as well. It's very, very easy to create and handle time series data, and it's a great way to monitor your services. Um, so what I really want to hit is this opportunities for visualization, uh, because this was one of our, like I talked about in the beginning, one of our main goals for Kubernetes was to be able to visually understand the traffic that was going through um, our clusters. So um, as you can see in the, in the bottom right here, uh, a very, very popular method of understanding the statistics that are, that are exported, the, metri sorry, the metrics that are exported by, the, uh, by Prometheus is by importing them into Grafana. And what Grafana allows you, you to do is allows you to create these dashboards that monitor and scrape your Prometheus endpoint that is implemented into your code. So say scrape every five seconds, pull the current, um, call the say pull the current uh, bytes in from a certain IP, and then you're going to graph them, and you're going to be able to see all this traffic and visualize. I mean, really, whatever you want, uh, which makes Prometheus a very, very, uh, uh, very, very interesting uh, manager of time series data. Um, what you can also do with Grafana is uh, do a little bit of aggregation and, and processing here before you even uh, push any of this data upstream into any, any of your other systems is you can do some, you know, uh, some averaging using uh, Prometheus QL, PromQL. Uh, you can put it into some bins, figure out where your 90th percentile is for uh, latency and, and whatnot. Um, and Grafana is a really, really nice, easy open source solution to visualize where you're at with your Prometheus data. Um, Kubernetes provides a, um, a, a base dashboard, so you can hook Kubernetes up, follow the install script we'll talk about in a second, and immediately have a dashboard that might look something like this, but has some preset um, charts and graphs to give you a good idea of what the networking and traffic looks like in your cluster. Um, so then, uh, I'm going to go quick through here because you know you're probably mostly familiar with, with Kubernetes, um, but just to give you a good idea of how we implement it um, and just some of the basics that we, uh, the community generally finds pretty interesting um, about Kubernetes that I especially um, was very uh, interested in learning about and understanding at a very conceptual level. Um, so here is how I visualize generally Kubernetes in my head. Um, so say you on the left are a user and you need a way to take this configuration, this state I want to put this cluster in and these resources in, and you need a way to automatically manage that, uh, have a tool that automatically partitions um, the resources in a meaningful way that you know, elegantly um, manages this, this state. <coughs> so what Kubernetes is going to do is going to take it, it's going to take its stamp, it's going to stamp out um, the state, 
and it's going to put, say, pod 1 in node 1, uh, pod 2 in node 2, and that's great. You have this, the exact state you wanted uh, that was specified in this config.yml. Um, but things don't always go um, as elegantly as that, and say pod or node 2 just dies or something happens to it. Uh, Kubernetes, this is where Kubernetes shines because what Kubernetes is going to do, it's going to see, oh, it's gone, uh, but we still need to maintain this state that the user wanted. Um, so even though we don't have two nodes now, we still need to maintain these two pods, these two containers um, that the user wanted. So what we're going to do is we're just going to push uh, pod 2 into node 1 because uh, there's probably a, a rather crucial service that is in um, pod 2. So really what this comes down to, comes down to um, is this state, which is specified in this uh, config.yml. Um, specifically in the, say, in the uh, case of Kubernetes, we're looking at the daemon set. Um, there are a few different kinds of what are called Kubernetes objects, um, but mainly what we focused on in Kubernetes was the daemon set because this allowed specifically um, allowed deploying a pod on each of the nodes that we had available. Um, I believe the most common is something more like a deployment, but if you have um, questions as to how those work, I would go uh, and look at some of the examples that are out there for deployments. Uh, they're quite common. Um, and that sort of brings me on to my second point um, in terms of stuff that I have taken from this experience uh, is mostly that <laughs> use examples. Um, I found specifically that the YAML uh, format is a bit hard to understand if you just immediately give it a glance. Um, it looks very uh, flexible and it's very fluid as to how you structure it, um, which is a good thing for, um, for some cases, but it is very difficult to see it and uh, understand what's trying to be told and said. Um, it's not very self-documenting, so when you can use comments, use comments, um, but definitely use some examples. And if you want to develop your own um, specification or configuration, I would definitely start with a configuration that already exists. Maybe pull a YAML from an open source project. Um, I know a big inspiration for sort of the structure um, and some of the interesting parts that I was having trouble with um, were pulled and uh, were referenced to uh, some Celium, some Celium YAML, because uh, they also use daemon sets, uh, and it was a good idea. It was, uh, it was a good way of getting a good idea as to how they structure things and the necessary parts of the YAML that were going to need to be there. So, <clears throat> just to give you uh, a brief overview of Kubernetes, of uh, Kubernetes before we get into the demo. Um, and a bit more detailed look at its components. Um, I would highly recommend checking out the, the, uh, the GitHub repo. There's some basic install instructions if you would like to check out uh, and, and try it for yourself. It's uh, quite basic, shouldn't take you more than a minute or two to get things up and running. Uh, there's a, like I said, there's a Grafana dashboard um, supplied along with all of the, uh, the code in the, um, in the repository. So if you just want to install it really quick, and point your Grafana and point Grafana to it um, to the Prometheus endpoint. You should be great, and you should be able to see all of your your cluster traffic. Um, it's very, very, it's quite simplistic. So really, um, Kubernetes. Uh, one of its goals for Kubernetes was simplicity. So really, it's a great start for new contributors. So I highly recommend if you're new to the uh, cloud native uh, compute landscape. I would highly recommend uh, giving some issues here a look um, and having this next slide. But if you would like to read more um, about the, some of the development process, um, the structure of Kubernetes that I'm going to talk about in a second, um, definitely check out a blog post I wrote um, over the summer. Um, you see the bit.ly link here, uh, Netsy blog post. Uh, it's about a four minute read, not too long. Um, but like I said, there's really some great starter issues here. Um, if you're new and you'd like to get involved, um, these are just some small enhancements that you know, through, through Gemini's calls um, that we, we came up with 
and some things that we decided that we might want to implement in the future, some more complicated features that probably weren't going to get done in the, the time that we had available. Uh, but just some, some interesting things that we saw that uh, the community might have some more use for. Um, and then a few bugs here, as you can see, um, that were not able to be resolved, that kept coming up every once in a while for different reasons. Um, so definitely uh, highly recommend checking out the issues here. So <clears throat> just to give um, an overview of how we, each, how we used each of the different components in the, sorry, the technologies uh, that I, I uh, talked about briefly, um, there are three main packages that make up the, uh, the binary that is deployed um, across the cluster. Um, this is yeah, EPPF in the tracker package, um, Prometheus in the collector package, and the Kubernetes uh, API and the cluster package. Um, in the tracker package, we have eBPF um, from the datadog agent slash eBPF library that aggregates some uh, very sort of basic uh, rudimentary networking statistics, uh, mainly bytes in and bytes out, and we track this for each of the different uh, connections um, for both the destination and the, uh, the source. So we get an idea of where it's going, where it's coming from, uh, how much and how little. Um, and this is very, very helpful when we get to uh, the Gravana visualization because with the visualization, we can actually see uh, you know, <coughs> uh, with Prometheus and the Grafana visualization, um, we can see over time, how does this connection, what's happening with this connection? Um, are we seeing a lot of traffic from this one, uh, this one IP, this one service? Um, and that's where we also see uh, some help from the Kubernetes API because what the collector does is uh, whenever it sees an IP being reported from the tracker, it looks and queries Kubernetes and it says, uh, is there an IP or a, is there a service with this IP? Is there a, a node with this IP? Is there a, a pod with this IP? And if there is, it queries for its name uh, and some more identifying uh, labels about it and tries to fill those in. So what's actually going to be exposed in, uh, going to be exposed by Prometheus is the um, is some more detailed information about the state of the cluster rather than just the networking. Um, so when available, we fill in um, information about the Kubernetes cluster rather than just the raw networking. Um, and the Ku Kubernetes binary is going to implement um, this collector and it is going to start this process which um, uh, binds this HTTP server uh, to uh, expose this metrics endpoint. Uh, so now I'm going to give a quick demo um, of some of the eBPF um, capabilities uh, and, and packages that we used and some of Kubernetes, uh, just to give you a quick idea of what was developed over this, over this time. So now for the second part, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, Kubernetes functionality and how this, this implements the tracker package to provide uh, a good overview of the networking statistics in your cluster. Um, so the first thing that we're going to do uh, is we're going to open up Kind. I have a Kind, uh, a kind cluster running right now uh, that is working with, uh, with kubectl. Um, so to follow this demo, uh, really what, the, what we're going to be doing is going through the Get Started page of um, uh, the GitHub repo. Um, that is also detailed uh, a little bit more, it's a little bit more in detail on the blog post that I wrote. Um, you can go through the manual instructions there as well that was on the previous slide. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to use the apply that was on the readme to just quickly install the daemon set into our cluster. Um, you could use the, the install.yaml that is found in the source um, or you could just use this. Um, this is much quicker if you just want to get, uh, get it started and give it a quick try. Um, so after we apply it and we get it in um, and installed, we are going to get the pods to see uh, and demonstrate that our Kubernetes pod is now running on our one node here. Um, you are going to need to use um, all namespaces here and specify uh, the namespace in the future as it is, it is it, as it is installed into Kube's system. Um, so as we see, we have a Kubernetes pod, Kubernetes R79JM. 
Um, I'm going to go ahead and just copy this uh, so we can use it later. Um, so the next thing we want to do is we want to port forward, port forward this pod so we can access it from the outside really quick. Um, we want to put in the pod name as well as we're actually also going to need the dash n for kube system to specify the namespace which it, it is in. Um, and then we want the uh, source port which is 9655 and we want it to be bound to 9655 on the other side as well. So now this is going to forward all of our traffic from the outside in. I'm going to open up a new. Now what we can do uh, now that it's on port 9655 on our local host, um, we can do things like curling the metrics endpoint uh, from Prometheus. Um, 9655. Um, oops. So now we can go ahead and curl the metrics endpoint uh, that is actually running in our, uh, in our Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes cluster and we get all these Prometheus stats. Um, and as you might... <laughs> As you might understand here, um, these aren't very useful. Um, it's fun to see, and it's some maybe nice information that includes uh, you know, different statistics about you know, you know, the network, but also some information about where uh, you know, the source and destination, the namespace that they're in. Um, but that's not really all that helpful. We don't want to have to keep looking through all of these. Um, we can get a little bit better of an idea of you know, specifically the ins and outs if we use just maybe quickly grep something. Um, so we're going to quickly grep bytes received, pipe it into grep, and look at bytes received. OK, this is maybe a bit more useful. Uh, we can see all of the bytes received and the bytes received per second. This is some interesting data. Um, and if we just take a quick look here, um, we see all of the different, um, a bunch of different labels to differentiate um, the specific connection. We see, um, oh, it's coming from uh, a, it's going to a pod. The destination is Kube Controller Manager, uh, Drew Cluster, um, and a bunch of different uh, labels about the Kubernetes environment that it is in. Um, now, this is very, this is interesting, um, but as you might want, this is extensible, and you can always pipe this into Grafana. Like I said, uh, we won't be doing that today. Um, is it? We won't be doing it today. Um, but as you can see, it should look something a bit like this. Um, a bit like this, um, where you can see um, the different networking, uh, the different connections, and some of the information of how them filled in, uh, the pod name. Uh, you know, sorry, the name of the object and uh, bytes per second and whatnot, and the number of connections. Um, so yeah, this should uh, hopefully give you uh, just a quick look at what Kubernetes does, even though it's a bit simple. Um, I do believe that you know, with some a bit more love, it can grow to be um, a helpful networking observability tool. So that was just a quick demo of some of the functionality of Kubernetes. Uh, along with the, some of the EPPF code that was utilized to create it. Um, but now I want to go into some of the, uh, the takeaways and what I, what I really learned and gained from this, this experience developing open source software uh, over the summer. So big one here, uh, open source and cloud native community foundation projects are for everyone. Uh, at a high level, they're re really just not um, that hard to, to, to grasp. Um, I recommend everyone um, if you're unfamiliar, just take a look um, and really learn by doing them. And what I mean by that, you don't absolutely need um, to you don't need to develop the next network observability application to learn from them. Um, just creating a deployment or using Kind to um, start up a daemon set like that, it really is um, the best way to start learning about these different tools. Um, that'll absolutely benefit you in a professional or just a, a learning environment. <clears throat> but if you can, I would absolutely recommend you know contributing to these these projects. Um, 
leverage your open, all of the open source code that has been written and you know, do your best to create something that is maybe just for fun. Uh, if you want to contribute to any of the, cl the cloud native projects, absolutely, that is one of the best ways you can possibly learn and it is one of the most beneficial to the ecosystem. You're supporting open source software, you're supporting uh, the entirety of you know, anyone using cloud native apps really. Um, so you know, that brings me to my end here. Uh, I'm absolutely would love taking more questions uh, you know, at the Q&A here or um, at Slack, just send me a message or you can send me an email here. Um, you can see me, see me my GitHub profile um, slash Drew Rip. Also, absolutely, I would definitely recommend um, looking at Armada. They have some great um, open source tools on GitHub available. Uh, major one, uh, Caverno, uh, doing some policy management. Um, see them on Twitter and visit their website. <coughs> um, so yeah, that brings me to an end. Uh, thank you all for listening. Um,